item on our agenda this evening is a committee reports. Um, let's start with a police commission. Go ahead, please. All right. So, uh, <coughs> Mike and I serve on that body, and uh, I we've kind of split up our report here for you. So I'm going to give you a little bit more information. I mentioned at a prior meeting a little bit about the um, police commission retreat, which happened um, on May 11th, and. Uh, at that time, I had said that the, so the retreat was for the police commission to work on their work plan, which uh, by ordinance has to come to the council, and they were going to present a work plan that was a slightly different format from what had been seen in the past. So rather than very specific project areas, they were really looking for some more outcome-based work that they're going to do in terms of um, serving the community, serving as an advisory body for the chief. So when that work plan comes before us, it won't look as prescribed maybe as a prior work plan might have. Um, but I feel confident that um, either myself or the chair, if, if she, I'm sure she'll try and attend when that comes before us, can ex kind of talk us through it. Um, <clears throat> they also made some decisions around organizing their work. That's partly um, why the work plan will look different in terms of um, and I might not have all these details exactly right, but uh, get, getting rid of the subcommittee <coughs> process. So bringing more of the work directly to the table, having more conversation during the actual police commission meetings themselves rather than in subcommittee meetings, because part of the dynamic that's happened is there's been very robust conversations in the subcommittee, and then a lot of that gets done over again at the full commission level. So in order to be more effective and efficient and transparent um, and make it easier on the public to keep track of what the police commission is working on, um, they decided to uh, basically eliminate a lot of the subcommittee work. Um, and that's also has to do with the capacity of the police commission itself. Uh, at this point, we had a chair who was serving on the commission and all the subcommittees, which really seems like a big burden on a volunteer uh, community member. So it was a very uh, well-attended, uh, great participation in the retreat. People really put their heads together to think about how they can make this body relevant and meaningful and accountable. Uh, and I think they came away with a really good product and a good commitment, a, a recommitment to uh, the commission itself. Right. I think Claire covered a lot of fantastic stuff <coughs> we talked about at police commission. <coughs> Excuse me, there were a couple of others in the last couple of months. <coughs> Excuse me again. Uh, we had a, a, a rather lengthy discussion over the course of several meetings about the location for the police commission meetings. Um, there was, uh, there were a, a few citizens, as we've had at our public forum, who gave input that they would prefer that the police commission meetings were not held at police headquarters because those particular community members viewed the police in a uh, adversarial way. So uh, we had uh, multiple discussions and multiple votes over multiple meetings and finally came to the place that we will continue to have the police commission meetings at police headquarters and that that uh, that discussion is now thoroughly ended. Um, we had a presentation this last time by the animal services folks within the police department and their work to uh, supplement what goes on with the county service level and the two officers who, who deal with dogs and cats and other animal issues that get reported in the community through into the police department and their techniques and their training and their uh, uh, response. And we also had, the, there's a public information officer there who helps the community understand what they can and can't do. And the, I think some of those presentations, like the PowerPoint that we saw, are available uh, through the police department. They also have a new um, community awareness campaign that we've seen some members of the chamber and other local celebrities participating in as well. <clears throat> we also then, in the previous <coughs> month's meeting, uh, had a very thorough discussion of park use restriction policy and how the police respond and in what circumstances, um, much like with the downtown <coughs> public safety enforcement zone area, uh, there's a very parallel sort of thing that they do to city-owned parks. And so we had a, a pretty thorough discussion about police response within uh, that framework as opposed to public streets. 
that. We then had a, a, a good conversation as well from the folks at dispatch and call taking about uh, the sort of training that they get and the sort of day-to-day -day things that they go through. And I'm here to tell you that there isn't any way on God's green earth that I could do that work with the amount of of precision and calmness that you have to have in those moment-by-moment -moment emergency situations. And, and you know, I, I think we should all be real thankful for the folks that do it. And that's it. Thank you. How about the Lane Metro Partnership? That would be me, but I haven't been at the last two meetings, so I'm... Okay. Okay. How about Lane Workforce Partnership? Um, nothing new. They're budget cutting and um, trying to get more employers to prefer people with a work readiness certificate, and they are, have made a lot of progress on that. But they've reduced the, the space they have because of budget, and they're going to have to reduce staff even more, probably. Thank you. Okay, how about Lane Transit District MX? That's me again. Okay. Okay. But before I get into that, I'd just like to give a little shout out to the Harlow Neighborhood Association. <laughs> um, the winners of two national awards from the Neighborhood USA, one of them was Neighborhood of the Year, and this is national recognition, and the other one is the first place for best social revitalization project and that was for their Feed Hope program that they do. Um, basically what it is, it's a, a local a food drive. Uh, they put together breakfast and lunch uh, foods for the children that qualify for the free lunch programs during the semester or the, the winter break and the spring break, and they're going to start doing it, try to do it for the summer also. So they won uh, recognition for both of those. And they're going to have a celebration, the Harlow Neighborhood Association Neighborhood Party, on June 15th, between 1 and 4 p.m. And it will be at the North Park Community Church. So just a shout out to uh, mm. uh, the, the Harlow Neighborhood Association. And then on to the Lane Transit District. The EMX Steering Committee met last week. Um, our big issue, I guess, would be the update that we received on the West Eugene EMX project and um, what is Ellen's organization again? Is it Cogito? Co uh, Cogito. Cogito yeah. came and I was trying to take notes and keep up with them on, as far as the outreach that they've begun with the um, businesses along the proposed route but I couldn't write fast enough and I've asked them to send something to the council so we all have the same amount of information. Uh, they're going to be doing uh, up to three personal contacts with the, the businesses, depending on if their property is going to be affected or needs to be uh, changed in some way. Uh, they're also going out, um, I think it's a, it was a half, half a block beyond the route to the residential areas, the apartment complexes. Um, they've started a project blog that will be updated every two weeks. Uh, so it's starting the engineering phase is beginning on that already, and this is one of the mailers that they sent out. So that's moving along. Uh, however, um, we were during the public comment period at the meeting, a member of the OMOT, the Our Money, Our Transit, advised us that they were in the process of getting ready to file a lawsuit and that may or may not hold up the project depending on where that goes. So they have until I think it was June 17th to file that. So we'll see how that goes. Um, they're continuing working on the Main Street McVeigh Transit Feasibility Planning. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of vision planning going into that and pedestrian crossing projects looking into that. So there's a lot of work going on to that also. And then we spent some time going over there um, long-range transit plan update um, basically their their goals and objectives and how they're going to get there so it just kind of went through those and discussed them and tried to do some wordsmithing on it as we went along okay and how about um, Mackenzie Watershed Council I'll pass okay anybody else have anything for the good of the order they want to um, Discuss. I I keep hearing about people are very concerned about animal control, and about where the 
officers are concentrating in South Eugene. And I think you've all heard some of that at public testimony, but I hear a lot about that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I brought this from our MPC meeting this week. This, uh, this is a, a um, picture of the two new Talgo trains, Mount Bachelor and uh, get what did, uh, Mount Bachelor and Mount Jefferson are the names for the two new Talgo trains. Uh, more than 1,200 people participated in a month-long survey, and the winners rose easily above the other possible names. The two new 13-car train sets. Our, actually, Oregon's first train sets are currently undergoing employee familiar, familiarization and quarter testing and are expected to be in revenue service this summer. Oregon purchased these trains using funds from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. The cost was $38.4 million with an additional $6 million in expenses for spare parts, testing, Wi-Fi, things of that sort. Each of the new trains offers seating for 275 passengers, a bistro car, a dining room, bicycle storage, cool bicycle storage, and business class seating and Wi-Fi. So I'll pass that around for you all to cool. look at. Cool. Huh? Yes, Greg. Uh, Mayor, um, I attended, uh, I know this isn't on the, on the agenda, but I did attend the Joint Police Commission, Human Rights Commission uh, meeting about the downtown uh, public safety zone and the fact that it's going to be sunsetting mm -hmm. later on this year. Um, they had about 12, 14, 14 initiatives that they kind of put forward, um, you know, to address some of the issues around that once the the exemption sunsets. But uh, I think they're going to go back and look at doing some revisions around that um, and maybe uh, bringing us a more comprehensive uh, list of initiatives, so I think that's a progress in, progress. in work, yeah. work in progress. City Manager, you have anything? Uh, no, ma'am. So the only other thing I would say is I had the um, uh, privilege of being with uh, Harlow Neighbors when they went to uh, receive those awards, and they made they did us all real proud, and um, it was a wonderful thing to to happen for our, our, our community and they set a good example for folks all over the country so appreciated that project a lot and uh, River Road in Santa Clara got a second place for the work they've done on scroll so we were well represented and they've lured the big national conference with all of the members to come here next year for a conference so that's all good economically for us so it's a win-win all the way around Okay, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, and that is the work session on CORE Campus. The manager. Thank you, Mayor, and I'll turn this over to Mike Sullivan and his team to continue the conversation that was started last week, or, yeah, so. So tonight we will continue the Council's consideration of the CORE Campus development proposal and their MUPTI application. We'll briefly provide responses to some of the questions that were asked by Council at the last meeting try to set the core project in the context of the ongoing council discussions on changes to the MUPTI program by looking at the benefit scorecard uh, that you uh, saw at the uh, prior meeting and, and compare that with the project that's been put forward. We'll review CORE's proposal for the use of the city-owned property at 901 Franklin, which we discussed briefly last time. And lastly, we'll revisit the proposal for additional payments and look at some of the changes that have been made to that proposal since our last meeting. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. If she'll turn it back, and we'll go back and forth a little bit. Thank you. I'm going to review the written comment that we received on this project and provide follow-up information from your May 29th work session. Starting with the written comment, the existing MUPTI program provides for a 30-day written comment period. For the core campus application, the comment period ended last week. We received 27 written comments, 18 unsupportive of the project, and 9 in support. In general, the concerns included the structure of the program and tax exemptions, the market impact of additional student housing, and the form or height of the project. While the general support included consistency with Envision Eugene, the construction jobs, and the impact on downtown and the economy. At the May 29th work session, several questions came up about the traffic impact analysis, or the TIA, and whether it would be required and whether it would cover bike and pedestrian safety. 
Based on the combination of residential and commercial in the proposed core campus project, it appears that the TIA will be required. This will be confirmed at final design. By code, the TIA only looks at the impact of automobile traffic on the system and does not analyze the impact in terms of bicycle or pedestrian traffic. In regards to bicycle and pedestrian safety, Core Campus states a shared interest with the Downtown Neighborhood Association in supporting bike and pedestrian safety. Core Campus provided the information that is in attachment E of your packet, describing the design elements they would include in the hub to facilitate safety and access. Such things as a streetscape barrier along East Broadway, so residents and visitors are not tempted to cross the street mid-block, working with the city on options for a pedestrian crossing at the corner of East Broadway and Ferry Street, and lighting, signage, and maps for residents and visitors. Another area of discussion at the last work session was on the college student growth forecasts. Whether the University of Oregon, Lane Community College, and Northwest Christian University are expecting to grow as that relates to the potential demand for this project and impact on existing student housing. The research we compiled is in attachment C of your packet. On the demand side, approximately 24,000 students attend the U of O, uh, which is 22 of those, 22,000 of those are full-time. At Lane Community College, they have 15,000 full-time students, and Northwest Christian University has about 600 students. Over the past five years, the U of O has grown by 23%. Generally, the forecast is for flat or 1% growth expectation among those three schools. On the supply side, 4,000 students live on campus, on the University of Oregon campus. 8,000 live near campus, and this is based on the survey results from Duncan and Brown real estate analysis, which leaves 10,000 students living outside of the university area. We have 1,600 bedrooms online to be completed for the 2013-2014 year near campus. And these are bedrooms rather than units, and it does include phase one of the capstone project on Olive and 13th Street. Even with the completion of these units, an estimated 8,000 full-time students will be living outside of the university area. Briefly, I'll mention a few other pieces of information. Attachment B of today's packet, we included some examples we found of public-private partnerships to develop housing in communities with colleges or universities, including Michigan, Missouri, Arizona, New York, and Connecticut. Some of these projects use existing tax incentive programs to develop housing specifically for students, while others use the student housing component to anchor a larger mixed-use development that includes tax incentives in addition to direct government funding. We've also provided two handouts with additional information at your spaces that was requested since you received the agenda item packet. I'll pass it back to Mike. CORE has made application uh, under the uh, current MUPTI program, but we'd like to uh, set this project again in the context of the Council's discussions, ongoing discussions about revisions to the MUPTI program. And we'll take a, a quick look at how the CORE proposal compares with the draft uh, MUPTI public benefit scorecard that the Council uh, recently reviewed. First on that scorecard are the threshold criteria. And with respect to boundary, it's simply w either within the boundary or outside the boundary, and core is within the existing boundary and within a likely boundary, depending on council action. Uh, with respect to density, this would be a very dense development. As a matter of fact, it would be the equivalent of 318 units per acre, which exceeds the density uh, 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 maximum for R4 development in the community. This is a very dense development. Uh, with respect to project need, uh, we walked through financial analysis at the last meeting that demonstrated that uh, the project could not go forward uh, without the MUPTI because it would not be economically feasible. With respect to green buildings, uh, the uh, core project proposes uh, to be built to uh, lead silver uh, standard, which is higher than the existing program, but consistent with some of the uh, discussions that Council has had. Uh, in neighborhood contact, uh, CORE has received comments uh, from the downtown neighbors, which is indicative of the support of the uh, discussion and, and dialogue that they're having with the Downtown Neighborhood Association. They've also received support from the Downtown Neighborhood Association. 
uh, with regard to affordable housing, another one of the threshold criteria. Corps has proposed a series of payments uh, to be made to the city, which could be used by the council, uh, be applied to uh, support aff affordable housing efforts. And lastly, with regard to local hiring, Corps has indicated their plan and their goal uh, to pursue hiring locally. They've also provided information uh, that's in your packet about past projects that supports their positive history and track record in local hiring. Moving on to the additional criteria uh, from the scorecard. Uh, there's still some discussion that the council will need to have on these items uh, first to see if this is a definitive list that you want to continue on with, but also to clarify some of your meaning, but just uh, taking a quick scan. Uh, again, on location, uh, this is a brownfield site, which would make it a, a target site for redevelopment. It's on uh, a principal Envision Eugene corridor, which would make it a target site. It's within the downtown plan area, which is one of uh, the longstanding uh, goal areas for redevelopment. And it could potentially contribute to development momentum out uh, in the courthouse district and contribute to uh, redevelopment in the riverfront area. These are all either long-standing or emerging goals of the, the council and the community. With respect to affordable housing, the minimum criteria that we've discussed with council has either been to incorporate some affordable housing into a project or to make a payment that would be equal to 10% of the first year's exemption. In CORE's case, this would be equal to about $45,000. CORE has now proposed payments uh, that equal roughly 20% of the total tax exemption over the 10-year period, uh, and this amount would be around $985,000 in excess of the minimum threshold. So by the current standard and discussions, uh, that's pretty significant um, uh, performance on that criteria. With respect to accessible units, uh, CORE does uh, uh, propose to include accessible units within their development that would provide for uh, accessible units. The uh, design neighborhood compatibility um, uh, standard, certainly this is a matter of opinion, uh, but this is a corridor location, and that corridor itself creates a buffer um, from the adjacent neighborhood. This project may lead uh, to uh, uh, increasing density along the corridor, and this construction type is of a type that we rarely see in this market. So it has many characteristics of, of design and neighborhood compatibility that uh, are, are positive, but again, there's, uh, this is certainly a matter of opinion. With regard to neighborhood commercial retail, uh, the plan includes uh, commercial retail space as part of the development. Uh, this would contribute to street-level pedestrian activity along the stretch of uh, Broadway. Uh, it would also provide services to residents of the development as well as res residents of the neighborhood. Embedded parking. Uh, CORE proposes embedding a, a certain amount of parking within the development. They also propose providing some parking that is relatively close to the site that would be surfaced, so that some yes and some no. And lastly, with regard to transportation options, the development proposes uh, providing a limited amount of parking. Uh, taken together with uh, bike storage and a liberal policy about bikes and units, provision of a flex car, and a location that's walkable uh, to campus and the downtown, the project, by its characteristics, seeks to encourage the use of alternative modes of transportation, so it performs fairly well in this regard. In sum, the core proposal seems quite responsive to many of the changes that are being considered by Council uh, to the Muppy program. I'd like to move on uh, quickly and briefly uh, to talk about uh, 901 Franklin. As we discussed at the last meeting, CORE has expressed interest in the city-owned property uh, at 901 Franklin to provide supplementary parking. You recall this property was made uh, generally available for sale in, in the community about two years ago and that it was actively on the market for about a year before we uh, received uh, one offer for purchase. After some negotiation, uh, the, uh, that offer was presented to Council, and Council accepted a purchase offer of $715,000. Uh, that offer was later withdrawn during the diligence period. This is some development um, issues and challenges with this site, uh, specifically with regard to circulation and access. It's kind of an unusual shape. 
We've had discussions with CORE uh, either regarding either the sale or the lease of this property uh, pending the Council's approval. The parameters of that sale or lease would be based largely on that transaction that was previously brought to Council and approved. We'll be forwarding a separate AIS for Council's consideration of the 901 Franklin transaction uh, at an upcoming Council meeting. Lastly, I'd like to review uh, some changes, some late-breaking changes um, to the additional payments that we discussed last time. You'll recall, Corps had proposed making additional payments to the City in the years 6 through 10 of the exemption, uh, which would have totaled $955,000. These payments equaled about 18.5% of the total exemption. And after these payments, a cash on cash return for the development uh, averaged over the 10 year period to 9.7%. We've had further discussions with CORE after our uh, meeting with the Council, uh, and uh, they have, in fact, revised their offer, uh, increasing the payments in years 8 and 10 by $25,000 and $50,000, respectively. Uh, after these additions, uh, the additional payment stream would uh, total $1,030,000, again, during that last uh, uh, five-year period. The additional payments would now equal 20% of the total exemption uh, for the 10-year period. And uh, the average return, cash-on-cash -cash return, projected by the developer uh, would be reduced to 9.66%. Tonight we hope to get direction from the Council to prepare this project for future action. The core MUPTI is scheduled uh, to come back to Council for consideration and action on June 17th. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I have George Brown in the queue. Anybody else? Um, I did want to um, surface a couple things. So, um, number one, the the site of the hub, the core uh, facility, is not considered to be in the campus area. Is that correct? Uh, I don't, I wouldn't consider it to be in the campus area so specifically. it's very close. It's not how we describe that area. Um, we hear uh, pretty consistently a lot of people talking about all the MUPTIs that are currently uh, being built. How many MUPTIs are currently being built? I believe just the capstone project, but we would have to, to verify that. So just to I make would sure. just say you could answer is the big project on university a MUPTI? No. Is a big project behind the pancake house a MUPTI? No. Is a big project up on Fairmont Boulevard a MUPTI? Nope. So all of those projects are student housing that's occurring on its own without any assistance from us, correct? That's correct. All right. Okay. George? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Well, and thank you for pointing that out, all of the development that's going on without MUPTI. That, that's a very apt uh, observation in my view. Um, I'd just like to start with some que questions about the answers to questions. Um, on this first handout that you left here, this is um, Division of Tax Impact. This is like 4,122,000. Is that the yearly foregone revenue? The average throughout the uh, at the bottom of the page? That's the average for average. year That's the estimate for year one. For year one. Okay. So so it so says City of Eugene general taxes uh, foregone is 160,000. That would be that would normally go to the general fund. Yes. Okay. And then 4J loses 172,000 in the first year. Is that correct? The amount not paid. Yes. Yeah. Right. The foregone foregone revenue. Okay. Then um, I'm just. I guess this is speculation. We can't know what how the conversation between core campus and their bank and their equity partner are going to go I, one of my questions was uh, you know have they approved this the proposed payments to the city um, I've got a feeling that it's possi possibly the payments might be unacceptable to the equity partner the equity partners DRW trading group 
they are closely held. They, they have no stockholders. They're, it's a group of investors who have formed this company. And, and you, know, you go to their website, and the only thing that's on there is positions open. They're hiring people, but it's not. they don't want any investors because all the profits will go to them. And so, um, I mean, it's quite different from a hedge fund even. So I'm, my guess is they, they might not be real happy with that, but that's speculation on my part. Um, and I, uh, one of my questions was not answered on this. Uh, I asked about you know the agreements with the other jurisdictions regarding the tax exemption, and one of my questions was, please provide counsel with copies of those agreements. Evidently, we only have it with 4J, because then with 4J in the city, that's 79 percent, and we don't need to get anyone else's agreement to um, divert these taxes, foregone revenues. So I would still like to see a copy of that agreement. Um, it's been brought up before by somebody else, I believe. George, there is not actually a written agreement. There is a motion that um, the 4J school board at some point in the past um, adopted. That's what, just like the council adopted the ordinance, 4J adopted a motion. We developed some information during the capstone conversation. We can certainly provide to you the information that we developed and that talked about here are the minutes from, I think it was a council meeting and maybe a 4J meeting that talked about those approvals. Okay. So if that's what you would like, we can I would like to see that, yeah. Okay. Sure. That, that, would, that would clarify it. Thank you. Um, okay, and then on F, on page 3, um, it says nothing in the answer to the question is about the commercial space, um, requiring that they don't get the exemption if they're competing with other businesses within a quarter of a mile distance and the answer to, well, I'll need it. I'll Another need round. round. Betty? Thank you. Um, question, you talked about a light, a traffic light at Ferry and Broadway or Franklin, whichever that is. Who would pay for that? Uh, uh, what I know is that the uh, Corps has had uh, some discussions with the, the city about uh, traffic control and a pedestrian crossing. Um, I haven't followed back up with the uh, traffic engineer. I don't even know that we would be inclined to put traffic control at that location. Uh, it's relatively close to other lights, but that would certainly be a matter for the traffic engineer. And I, I don't believe we've gotten to the uh, point of talking about how those improvements would be paid for. Well, discussing 30th Avenue, I've heard that a traffic light would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And there is certainly one needed there. So I just wondered, I hope that we're not thinking of spending that money for this location. Um, this is not a question, but I, I've heard from, you've all heard from people who are in, are worried about the competition, people who have student housing <coughs> units which are going unfilled and uh, they're losing money because they can't rent them. So in a way we would be subsidizing people who are competing with already existing businesses if we approve this. And how about taxes on the 901 Franklin? Does, would they get an exemption for that or the land would continue to pay us? So. 901 Franklin is a city-owned parcel, so there are no taxes paid <coughs> currently on it. If it's leased to a private party, it would become taxable. If they lease it, it will become taxable. If it's leased to any private party, it would become taxable. Including them. Okay. Um, I guess that's, I don't have any other question. Oh, I, th I think when they talk about making a contribution, it's not really a contribution. It's that we're we're giving them less than we might have, or they're getting less of a benefit than they might have. Um, and I still think if we continue with MUPTI, and I'm not convinced that we should, that having housing, affordable housing, as a part of it, I don't mean subsidized affordable housing, as a part of it should be a requirement. And I think they, they have said they're not willing to do that. Is that correct? Uh, this discussion that we've had, uh, much like the city of Portland, uh, either to include affordable housing or to pay make a payment 
uh, to support affordable housing offered that opportunity, uh, they opted to um, uh, seek to make a payment. But they would refuse to include it, is that correct? It's a student housing project, uh, probably not the easiest form of project to um, uh, mix tenant types, and I just mean students and non-students in that regard. Um, so uh, in, in a certain sense, uh, an affordable uh, payment to support affordable efforts might be uh, the most positive way for a project like this to support affordable housing. Thank you. Mike? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Can you tell me what the student uh, vacancy rate is right now? Local real estate? Like general yeah, general vacancy rate? Cannot. Uh, I've, oh, the I've, general multifamily vacancy rate? I was looking for more specifically to students, but I'm not sure that the, would be fine. I think that would be difficult to ferret out because as you get away from campus, there's really no distinction between a student unit and a non-student unit except maybe it was rented. And isn't students. it true that we've seen more and more students moving broad, more broadly into the neighborhoods? Well, the numbers indicate that there's up to 10,000 students that are moving that live out in neighborhoods uh, on some basis because they don't live in the, the penumbra of the, the campus. So I, I bring, bring up those questions because it's been put forward as, a, as an idea that somehow we don't need student housing. I think the city has spent, what, $85,000 in a previous year responding to parties, student parties <clears throat> in neighborhoods, and we spent a good deal of time coming up with ordinance to deal with um, social host issues around that very concern because of the fact that students are moving more and more into n established neighborhoods where there's some conflicts issues with those neighbors. So I think the idea of making sure that students have the ability to live closer to campus is, and having more availability close to campus is certainly a good thing. And s uh, we all know that there's some challenge with them growing on the same, at the, the university growing at the same pace that they have over the last several years. <clears throat> but certainly a very modest student growth of 2% a year means that they'll need at least 500 new units a year of student housing. And that's just at a very modest minor kind of growth rate, which would be easy, easy to assume. Um, one of the other things that I always find interesting in this conversation is when we talk about foregone revenue, we talk about it as if the city is spending some money or if, or, or it's, it would be money that we would get if we didn't grant this MUPTI. And I, and I think it's, it's something we should be careful of because we certainly need to talk about it honestly and intelligently that either this is project is not going to happen or it is going to happen with this discount but there isn't an in-between because they've said that. It's very clear. It's either that we're going to grant the discount and at some point in the future, in this case five years, we'll begin to get more and more and more property tax to the point where we'll have over 620000 a year <clears throat> or we'll continue to get the 10. But there isn't a foregone kind of place in the middle where we can say no and still get the money. We'll just still have the brownfield. So one of the interesting parts of this for me is how we talk about if we do that, we'll still have the cost of the students. Have we done an analysis to know what uh, a student uses as cost per year in city services? No, it's a very interesting question, but we have We have $126 million general fund, and we have 160,000 people in the community. So. We can start doing some basic math to figure this out, but I'd be very interested to know what the average student consumes in city services so that we can understand the investment on a, on a more accurate number scale. So just to clarify, um, Mike, during the time that um, if they got a MUPTI and it was being built, they'd still be paying on the land? Yes. And so you don't lose the tin that you are already getting so you're not losing anything right. you right. only stand to gain if something is built there that's correct and in that and so you forego when that happens uh, for a period of time but there's no there's nothing that we have that we lose right and the the current taxes are between ten thousand and eleven thousand dollars and if you just average the payments coming out of the last six years as proposed it's roughly two hundred thousand dollars a year, um, so it's 
significant flow uh, off of the project before it comes off the exemption, but a lot of that payment is concentrated in the last two years. So averaging is probably not a clear picture. Thank you for that. Anybody else in the first round wants to? Okay, second round, George Brown. Thanks, Mayor. Um, well, you know, first of all, I, I'd just like to point out that, you know, on this sheet here that we got in our packet, it's uh, the growth rate, this prediction, student population forecast is 1% a year, not 2%. Big difference. And I, I'll, I'll go over this, this sheet here in another round. I'd like to get back to the question, the original questions. Um, one of the questions was, uh, when will you provide, you, staff, provide counsel with a copy of the legally binding agreement between the city and core campus parent company in Chicago regarding the guaranteed payments to the city? Um, the council is not yet, here's the answer. The council has not yet passed a motion requiring such an agreement. If council does so, then an agreement will be drafted. The agreement does not need to be in place prior to approval of the exemption since the resolution can provide that it will not take effect unless and until such an agreement is executed. I strongly feel that we definitely need to see a nailed down agreement before we take a vote on approval because I'm sorry, I, I'm in business. I've been a businessman for 40 years. You have to have these things nailed down. Uh, all kinds of problems can go wrong later if they're not. And it's just, this is just how it's done when you're leasing a building or leasing a parking lot or, or any kind of a business agreement. It's, it's got to be signed by both parties. It's got to be nailed down. You can't just say, okay, well, let's approve this and then later we'll figure it all out. No, it's got to be figured out before, be, before uh, the application is approved. In, in my view, I, I think to do anything else it would really be irresponsible. I would certainly never do that in, in private business, and I don't know of any businessman that would. Um, any successful businessman, let me put it that way. Um, so I, I think it's crucial that that be a condition of approval. Um, now, I'll go back to the other one. Can a condition of approval require that any portion of the commercial space to be included in the exemption not be in direct competition with any similar business within a quarter mile of the project site? But that was the question. Here's the answer. Nothing in state law allows the council to condition approval of the MUPTI for commercial space on a non-competition agreement. Well, Portland's does. Portland's multi-program. That's, that's one of the conditions in there. It's regarded as a public benefit, actually. If they, they allow and encourage commercial space to be built if it's necessary, like in a food desert, for instance. They'd be thrilled to, to allow that exemption on the commercial portion of a housing project if there was a grocery store in an area where there were no grocery stores. So this this answer, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Portland does it. It seems like we could do it, too. I think we should do it, because otherwise we're subsidizing direct competition of existing businesses, and that's not acceptable. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. So, um, do you have any um, comments on the on the questions that uh, Councillor Brown just put um, forward? A couple things. First, George, um, that's my fault. If Portland does it, then I'll check with the city attorney's office up there and find out the basis that they have for doing it. Um, if they can do it, then you certainly can do it. Um, in the time that we had to try to answer those questions, I took a look at the statute. I didn't see that, but I'll certainly check with them and. We'll address that in the next AIS. Okay, thank you, Glenn. I, can I just respond very briefly? No. Okay. Oh, next round, you can. You anything else that you? No, want? I think we're fine. <coughs> so now you can because it's your round. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> well, I, I would just like to point out, you know, we we actually have been discussing this in, in, in previous meetings. We, we kind of went down, and I mailed uh, copies of Portland's whole multi-program to everybody. Um, like what two months ago and so that, that's okay uh, <laughs> but they they do that that's that's a significant um, portion of their granting these tax exemptions is that it, it's actually they encourage it but if, a, if you're going to give it but what they don't allow which I think is perfectly reasonable if you're if you're competing with an with an existing business 
to grant the tax exemption on that commercial space gives totally unfair advantage to, to a competitor of a pre-existing business within a quarter of a mile. And uh, it's not fair. It's not right. Um, it's just, you know, if we, I, I believe that we, we need to include this as a condition of, of approval for this because it will be, that's going to be one of the things that I think we probably will include in, in whatever revised MUPTI ordinance that we come up with. Um, okay, so let's go back down to another one. It's that one question was, uh, if the city receives cash payments from core campus and in the exemption year six to ten, will these payments be prorated to all the other jurisdictions that are foregoing ad valorem property tax revenue during the exemption period, i.e., the city, Lane County, 4J, etc.? The answer is council will need to decide when the payments are received, what should happen with them. And I think we should decide that before the vote on the approval. Um, it's only fair. <laughs> I think we need to prorate it to all these other jurisdictions, especially 4J. They're, I mean, they're just getting slaughtered. They're getting people approved bond measures for the buildings, but there's nothing for the teachers. And so the natural instructors and classroom sizes are growing. School days are being cut out. 4J and Bethel. This doesn't address Bethel, but it would certainly, there'd be a lot fewer uh, furlough days in 4J if they were able to receive some of those. I mean, I, you know, there's a bill going through the, the Salem right now to uh, for all of the um, urban renewal districts in Oregon. And there's almost a hundred money back to all the back to the State Department of Education, so it can be sent back to all the schools on a per student basis. Uh, it's just the trend. California got rid of 400 urban renewal districts. The state school system will receive billions of dollars because of it. And so um, I'd like to see us decide if these payments ever happen and if, the, if it, in fact, is approved, that it sh we should decide that before. Larry, you're next. Thanks. Um, so I don't have a lot of questions, but I did want to follow up on Councillor Clark's question about our vacancy rate in terms of rentals. And I think it would be really informative if we were able to see if any of the um, apartment management companies or rental agencies have an idea of what our vacancy rate is. And, and the reason that I asked for that or think that would be good information is we are hearing from folks in the community that they think we have enough student housing or there's too much student housing. And I think that's very arguable. Um, I don't think people recognize how much pressure the student rentals put on the cost of housing citywide and really affects the rates. And I know the landlords are going to hate me for bringing this up. Um, but if we had more housing, that would actually lower rents and would help folks who are struggling right now to find affordable housing. So I'm not saying whether that informs whether or not we grant this particular MUPTI, but I think in terms of our conversation around housing and not just student housing, because students don't necessarily just live in something that's designated as student housing. They compete with the rest of us who are renters uh, for the rental housing that we have in this community. And because they can pay, they often uh, drive up the rents in our in our area, not just around the university. So I would really appreciate it if we could dig into that a little bit. I did see in uh, at least one of the emails we received from a member of the public, he cited a 5% vacancy rate or, or said that 5% was, was ideal, quote unquote, which may be what landlords would like to see because it, um, again, <laughs> helps keep rents higher. So um, I'd appreciate an answer to that if we could get that. I just get a real clarification. Vacancy rates across the community, those within the, around the university, or both? Um, I would say if it could be Eugene specific, that'd be fine. If it's Eugene Springfield, because I know we do have some folks who live over in Springfield as well and attend the U of O, so I think regionally would be would still be useful information. It doesn't need to be. Sorry, yeah. It, and for me, it doesn't need to be particular to campus. But if we are able to narrow it down in any way, that would be great. Chris, you're next. Oh, I was going to answer. I was just going to add that uh, uh, also something that would be interesting for you to look at. You've seen it before is the uh, statistic on uh, housing cost burden, which is a juxtaposition of uh, household income and the cost of rentals, which 
certainly has a root in uh, median family income, but it also has a root in the, the uh, volume of the housing supply. Yeah, over 50%. It's, I believe it's like 54%, but I'm, I'm, Cost I'll get that back to you. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, it seems to me that, the, that this conversation really revolves around four um, points. Um, need, and that's specifically the issue around student housing or, or this particular project. The second one is compatibility. Is this project compatible with the community and what its goals are? Um, is there a true financial benefit, not just community benefit, that's, that measures in a variety of ways, but I'm talking about a financial benefit or return. And then the last one is what are the securities or guarantees that we would have if we entered into this project that we would get a return? Need is the toughest one because it's the one we keep going around on um, in terms of what does need look like and how is need defined. So I'll save it for last. Um, in terms of compatibility, after looking at Envision Eugene, after looking at what our goals are, I think this project is not out of scale. I mean, we are seeking more density and we're seeking more density in our core. And so I think some folks who say, oh, this project is way too big, um, for me, that's not the issue. Uh, I think we do want increased scale. We do want increased density. Um, is, is there a financial benefit? That goes back to the notion of if you grant the tax exemption, are you somehow um, losing money or giving up money? And, and to all the, the points that, that Mike made, um, right now we're making $10,000 on the site. The argument is, well, if you don't grant the MUPTI, then we'll make a whole lot more. But that site hasn't developed, and there's no likelihood that it would develop in some more positive way. So you can't give away what you don't have. Um, and so I think in terms of the financial benefit, uh, it's, it's, it's the notion of the discount or the investment as opposed to something you're giving away. I mean, how many checks have we written to developers? Zero. Um, because we have the money was never in the bank to begin with. It's all based on if it builds, then you get the money at some point in the future. The fact that they're offering a better return in years five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, whatever it is, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten, um, I think is definitely something that improves the return that we already were talking about. Um, so from that standpoint, I think the return is 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 there for me. Um, in terms of safeties and guarantees. Yes, it is critically important that we make sure that we have the proper contracts, the proper guarantees, the proper things worked out. And if there are things that we can work out um, beforehand and know, uh, then I think that's desirable. So now I'll come back to need. That is the 800-pound gorilla in this conversation. Do we need more student housing that is subsidized? Um, one of the arguments is, no, there's not going to be more students, but the point is, um, do the students need to move into better quality housing to make to take the pressure off other or to create better? And I think that's the conversation we need to have. So I'm going to um, oh, go ahead, Mike. If, if I might respond to, let's see, that uh, point number four, uh, the uh, security and guarantee. Uh, if the schedule of payments is um, included in the resolution that approves the MUPTI, then those payments arriving on that schedule are part of the conditions that keep the MUPTI in place. That um, um, agreement that's embedded in the resolution would actually survive uh, the core entity should there be a successor who owns that property who wants to continue that exemption. It's actually a, a very strong guarantee in and of itself. Thank you. So, um, I got you, Betty. Um, I want to, um, I'll let George and Betty, and then I haven't seen anybody else. I'm just going to ask you to think about now, and I'll go around the table, because at some point here you have to give some direction um, to the manager. And so I want you to think about what you would like to tell him that you would like him to bring back to you. And we'll just go around the table and hear from people and see if we have something that emerges from that that will give you some um, you. some direction. Okay. So, um, but first, I'll, Betty and then George. Thank you. Um, comment. We don't know whether someone else might build something there before ten there before five years from now, as the city gets more crowded. There, people are going to be looking for spaces, and 
we might get somebody might build something there uh, on which they would pay taxes immediately. Um, so we don't know whether we're giving up something or not. As for George mentioned competition, this is definitely in competition with other student housing. We've heard from people who tell us that they don't think it's right for us to subsidize competition for their business. They're, they're people who are in a smaller way in business renting student housing. And we would be helping someone else compete or maybe put them out of business if we approve this. That's all. Thank you. George? Thanks. Well, I'd like to go to this uh, student population forecast summary that was provided in our packet. I spent a little time studying that and analyzing it. And we see that 2012 full-time enrollment, almost 22,000 students. Uh, the university predicts growth of 1% a year. So I figured, OK, 10 years from now, what will the enrollment be? I mean, what will be the increase? Well, it'll be about 2,300 students, OK? And then we look down the list, and we see an additional six. And we know that there is a vacancy rate citywide of around 5% right now. This is what we know. This is what realtors have told us and property managers. And you can go online and, and go to the Eugene, uh, you know, whatever, the re retail housing uh, site and and you will you will see it's about five percent right now. I didn't pull that out of the air. Okay, so then we see that a, an additional sixteen hundred bedrooms are expected to be completed for the twenty thirteen fourteen year. All right, so let's go. Let's see an increase of twenty three hundred in the next ten years, minus sixteen hundred that are coming online this year alone. That leaves a deficit of seven hundred beds for the next ten years. All right, and uh, there's no. Pre what I'm trying to say, this tells me there's no pressing need to, for the taxpayers of Eugene to subsidize a new student housing complex. There's no critical need for more student housing right now, and so um, I think this speaks strongly against uh, approving the application. Um, also. <coughs> I would like to point out something here. Uh, you know, at a recent budget committee meeting, Councilor Clark correctly pointed out that a frequently voiced sentiment uh, was uh, that the new city hall should be financed by bond measure. And I think that's correct. What he left out, or one of the things he left out, was that <laughs> view that was frequently voiced and with strong opinions with equal frequency was the people's strong opposition to out-of-state developers receiving tax subsidies for unnecessary student housing. People are really getting kind of tired of this type of thing and actually concurrent distrust of um, city hall priorities. So I don't know. Um, I, I want another round just to discuss the rents and go, go a few things to make some observation about their application, material in their application. Happy to so do I need that. another round. I'll do Mike, and then whoever else wants to speak, then you, and then we'll do a round. Okay. I appreciated George's point and agreed with him that a number of people were are were and are uh, at least skeptical about out of state and out of area developers getting tax subsidies, and if there actually were any developers getting tax subsidies or getting paid in some way. I'd probably be concerned too, but it just doesn't happen. It's just that they don't understand that nobody's getting a check and nobody's getting a subsidy of any kind. They're getting a discount if they build a thing as an incentive. And I think that's a subtle difference perhaps. But I think if they knew all of the details of that subtle difference, they may not feel quite as strongly about it. But perhaps I'm wrong though. <clears throat> and I, I, I know it was quite a long while ago that I was a University of Oregon student, but uh, I remember the <clears throat> regular conversation about, uh, even during that time and, and after I got out of the university, about um, student vacancy rate and it being quite a bit less than 1% at the time. Now, I, I know that 
it's quite a bit more packed in the area and there are multiple you know uh, bedroom units where people are packed in pretty tight and I, I would find it surprising to learn if this the vacancy rate around the university was at five percent I would find that kind of shocking actually but I'll look forward to having staff tell us what it is thank you well actually they don't separate student housing out from the general I, I asked this question months ago during the cap I mean like almost a year a year ago during the capstone discussions and no one was able to separate it out so you pretty much have to depend on property managers in the university area and um, you know um, the, the housing there and nobody does it so it's, it's all just kind of generalized for Eugene and Springfield area and for Eugene specific so I wish we could ha I wish we could see those numbers also uh, but we can't so I just have another question on the student population forecast and, and the the one line where it reads an additional 1600 bedrooms are expected to be completed for the 2013-14 year does this include capstone phase one phase one I see and that's approximately 750 beds give or take yes so that leaves another 550 that will be completed the at uh, the year after so of those 700 the uh, theoretical beds that we need in 10 years that account that alone accounts for 550 of them so now we're down to 150 beds that we need in the next 10 years I'm just using the information that you provided and I'm sorry it just doesn't make sense to subsidize 550 beds but let's go to the rents okay so supposedly this aligns with you know envision Eugene and providing multifamily housing for you know our population growth forecasts what I'd like to suggest is that there is nothing multifamily about this unit whatsoever it is clearly intended for students and only students really from wealthy families out of state and out of country the studio let's just look at the rents this is on page 36 of their application the studio 1,000 a month one bedroom 900 a month two bedrooms this is what a family would be expected to rent two parents and one child or, or two kids two bedrooms 700 a month times two that's fourteen hundred dollars a month that's not affordable I'm sorry uh, there's no affordability component in this their proposal whatsoever you figure you know first month last month security deposit do you have do you have 33 oh, oh and a parking space is 65 bucks a month um, so do you have three thousand three hundred dollars working working family to live in this place no you don't it works totally against the affordability the idea of affordability and it's not multifamily housing so it won't do anything for the 40 percent of Eugenians who are rent burdened although I just heard a higher 50 did I hear 54 percent of rent burdened George. it's getting worse this won't help it um, I'm going to start over here with you and we'll go around but before I do that I just want to say that one of the things I feel is kind of lost in this conversation that students don't pick uniform housing any more than anybody else does there are students who can afford really expensive units there are students who will do very cheap units there are students who live with other people there are students who live by themselves some that close some far and so it's a matter of is driven by preference and um, and what people how people choose to live and how they can live just like with all the rest of the population so numbers are a little deceiving because you could that would be like you know talk about our caring capacity for our housing need in our community that means that we would all fit into one of those whatever was open for us and be happily located there like a little peg in a hole so and it just doesn't um, just doesn't operate like that so let's start with you mr. polling what do you want what do you want to tell the manager well it's about this yeah about the, I was gonna say, <laughs> can we narrow the focus mayor a little bit <laughs> smaller target smaller target um, I, I like the way the discussions have been progressing I like some of the changes that have been brought forward I encourage staff to continue those discussions uh, try to 
you know, come uh, come back with some some more improvements to it. And I'd like to see the um, proposed um, approval resolution uh, come forward with those uh, with those changes that that have been discussed already and the future discussions, and um, see where we go from there. I don't really have anything to add. Uh, all the questions have been pretty thoroughly thrashed out. Okay, so how, so how, what do you take from that is what I'm asking. I mean, for them, are, are you wanting him to come back with a, a uh, I guess he, well, you tell us what you want to, uh, uh, to know because I think I want to be sure I get as much of that as I can for you. Uh, and I appreciate that very much, Mayor. Uh, yeah, we're, what we're trying to do is come back to you on the 17th with something that uh, represents kind of generally where you might be headed knowing that you would make changes all along and could make changes in that and so we're just trying to make sure we bring something back to you that it's that it's um, something that you might expect to bring back that it's not a something way out of bounds and that's what we're trying to just get a sense of that so what I think I heard from the first two around the table is you're in the ballpark of what you should bring back right. not, not how they'll vote on it but you're in the ballpark of what you should bring back is what I'm hearing from the that's what I heard from those two, two. I would agree ball. with that yeah thank yeah, you I, I want to make that point clear mm -hmm. yeah I, I don't need any more information to me it's all it's all a bunch of policy questions I actually uh, I'm sorry <coughs> actually I We'll look forward to the vacancy information because I think that actually adds to a number of conversations we're having right now, both for the, as, as Claire mentioned, to the region, to the city as a whole, and then certainly with regard to multifamily and certainly to the degree you can uh, pencil the number for student vacancy rate. Also, one of the questions we haven't talked much about are the public policy uh, obligations the financial obligations that we could potentially have as that is a brownfield site. Um, what happens because of all the, you know, the issues of it being, having underground gasoline tanks there for so many years? Um, if somebody wanted to develop that for something else, what are, their, what are they looking at to start in an average cost to dig all that up and deal with it if they're not intending to put parking down there like these folks are? And what sort of amelioration costs would there normally be? I'd be interested to know that. Also be interested to know is if at any point, because as for the last eight years, nothing would be built there because of those costs to get started, um, that, that someday may be a public cost to clean up with the other things planned for that area. Is that likely under any circumstance, federal or state, that we could end up having to pay for that? So that's other information I'd like to have. Okay. And uh, I like the way it's progressing at this moment as well. There. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so other than that question about the vacancy rate, I guess I would have a similar question as to what Mike just asked about what would be the other potential for that site if we were to pass on this project. Um, I also want to say I appreciate the work that staff has done and uh, answering the questions and, and helping us guide us through this. Um, and I might have more questions offline since I missed the last meeting we had, and I apologize for not being able to follow up on that sooner. Greg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think that the scope of our discussion around vacancy is a little too narrow. Um, I look at this more in the context of the overall housing stock and available units throughout the whole regional area. Uh, certainly, you know, there's a large part of that that is, you know, student driven. But we're looking at an increase of, if you correct me if I'm wrong, I remember what the projections are of about 35,000 residents over the next 20 years, 20 years uh, which could go higher than that. And um, I, I'm assuming that there's going to be um, other needs that are driven outside of the, the campus core, the downtown core. And I would like to get some idea of what are the migration patterns as new units come online. Are those students and other people migrating out back from neighborhoods in back closer to the university, back closer to, to those, to those um, uh, 
you know, centers for where they're going to go to school and other things, and how that affects the ho the balance of the housing stock and the rest of the community, because I think that's critically important. Um, I think that if we are, you know, we're talking about affordable housing to some degree, um, this provides, in my mind, just, you know, um, just right off the top of my head, it provides some opportunity to drive some, some you know, um, rents down and make other parts of our community more affordable than what they currently are right now. So, um, and it also gives us an opportunity in other areas, I think, um, to do more development outside of the core. I also point out one other thing. Mupti's available to everybody, isn't it? Whatever developer there is. This is not a special program for um, out, of, out of state or out of town developers, is it? That's correct. It's available for anybody that's within the geographic designation for where Mupti can apply. That's correct. So if, if somebody that was local here wanted to apply for a Mupti, wanted to build a, a project of this scale or similar, they could do the same thing. And right. we're really not out any money, as has been pointed out. Um, this is basically value added as we go down the line. So if I can get some, some feedback as far as the, 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 the migration patterns and the vacancy rates outside of the area and how our development is affecting that as all of these different units come online, I think that would be real helpful in terms of overall long-term uh, projections. George? Well, I, yeah, if we could get, you know, um, student vacancy rates, which I, I seriously doubt if we could be able to get a comprehensive, you're going to have to make about 50 or 75 phone calls to do that. And I, I would love, I wish I would have had time to do that, but I don't. I want the manager to come back with a recommendation to reject the application because it doesn't meet our goals, will result in a serious overbuild at being subsidized by the taxpayers. We've just, we've, that's what I want. That's what I would like the manager to do is analyze all this information from credible sources. We've received information from Mr. Romani and Mr. Hellickson documenting the uh, building of student housing without subsidies. It will happen. We have heard from the U of O economist Tim Dewey. This is the ha portion of the housing market that doesn't need any subsidies whatsoever. Um, and I don't understand why we keep ignoring the clear evidence from very knowledgeable people, from players in this market. We've heard from property managers. We've heard from other landlords. Um, I, I, I don't understand why, why we would just discount their, their knowledge and information. Um, you know, uh, if we reject this, then core campus has, has, you know, they have a choice. One choice would be wait and see what our new requirements are with our new MUPTI ordinance. I would invite, invite them to reapply. If they could meet the, the minimum threshold requirements and, and have affordability components and clearly defined uh, public benefits, I would, I would welcome a project like that. But not, not with the subsidies and not for a student population, there's no, you know, it works against so many goals, affordability, there's no family, family <coughs> arrangements there, uh, there's really no diversity, but it's going to be a, 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 a serious, a, a transient monoculture of 18 to 21 year olds, and it's going to be perpetual. You know, there's no diversity there. It, it, for as many things as you say that it works for and aid of, there's, there's many more what it works against lots of our policies. And, um, you know, so then they're left with the choice. They can either reapply, and I would welcome them to do that, uh, or they can pick another asset class. This is also from their application. They list all these other ways to invest money and what your return is. And I say for 9% 9, 9 return, why don't they invest in large cap stocks? don't have to reinvest in real estate. There's, they, they can follow their own advice and go for one of these safer investments. As they admit on page 23, that this is risky. This is so risky to do this project. 
And yet they George. invite the Eugene taxpayers to share their risk, and I, I think that's George. improper. Daddy. Thank you. Um, yes, I want the option to say, no, we will not give a tax exemption. Um, I think if they want to build it, obviously they're doing it to make money. Anybody who goes into any business, I think, does it to make money. And if they can make money, they'll build it, maybe. But we, I wouldn't try to stop them from building something there. If they have the land and they want to build it, fine. But for us to subsidize it or take the risk out of it, I'm very much opposed to. And then a, a question that just occurred to me, is this even legal under Mufti when it is a family, is it even legal to call this multiple, multiple family housing? Multiple unit. Multiple family. Housing. Multiple, family. Unit. Multiple unit family. In, they have, they have family, family in there. <laughs> Multiple, Multiple unit, unit property tax exemption. Property tax exemption. But it's intended to be for family housing, isn't it? No. I don't no. specify. So it is legal. Okay, thanks. I will be voting against it at any rate, and I think that should be an option. And, and then if they decide they want to build it anyway, that's fine. Chris. Probably what would be most helpful for me, and maybe you can synthesize some of the conversations that's been going on, would be to create a couple of if-then scenarios. The first if-then scenario would be if we grant them up the and if the project is built, um, what would be the, the result? And we kind of know what the result is financially. We know what the result is in terms of a number. I'm talking about the specific result around um, uh, back to the need question again. Uh, what would be the number, quality, and rate of student housing in this area? If it were, if this, if this project were added into the mix, what would it do uh, to the to the number, quality, and and cost or rate of, of housing? Where would it be? Um, so where, how would students move around? That that would be the first if then. Um, the second if then would be if the project were not built, what would that impact be on? the number, quality, and rate of student housing in the area. Um, uh, and then an additional piece in that particular scenario, that if then would be um, what, would, what are the possibilities, what's likely to happen on that piece of property if this doesn't get built. I know that, yeah, you're right, nobody, can, nobody has a crystal ball and can predict the future. But we do know that the site has sat empty for a while. Uh, we talked before at a previous presentation that um, in terms of cost effectiveness, what somebody could make pencil out would be like a fast food restaurant or a bar. Um, the ability, and we had four experts say, these things have to pencil out. And so you can't just say, well, yeah, somebody else could build something great there. Um, it would have to pencil out. So part of the if then would be what are the realistic options for that site if you don't have any sort of a, a, a discount or a subsidy or or somebody, if somebody had to come in and spend their own dollars or bank dollars to build something, what kinds of things could be built there? I recognize that these if-then scenarios are requiring you to do two things. One, you're going out on a limb. But I'm saying to you, I want to hear your professional um, opinion. And I'll take it as an opinion. I will accept it as an opinion. That's perfectly fine. And you can talk to the, uh, to the experts that were at this table or any other experts you need to, to get their opinion to add to it as well. But I think the second thing is, this sounds like a lot of work. And, and one of the reasons to maybe invest a little bit of time in it is, we have these discussions, these kinds of discussions regularly, particularly around development and growth. Some of the knowledge that we could gain from these if-then scenarios, I think, could not only help us with the conversation we've got right now, but I would find it very instrumental for many of the conversations we're going to be having around growth and development. So it would not be an investment of a lot of time for just one project. I think this might be some interesting information to have these kinds of what if, if then, um, for many of the conversations we have around growth in our community. That's kind of what I was referring to about us using the implications wheel or something of that sort yeah. to help us sort of figure out, uh, for, sort of four rungs out uh, what the implications are, right? Okay, I've got George and Noik. Okay, um, just for clarification purposes, uh, with this application, like all the other MUPTI applications, when a resolution comes to us for the final decision, there's always two. There's one yes right. with these conditions, and there's the other one is no, do not go forward. So that that is the, the no resolution is automatically coming back to us. My comments were were basically 
directed towards city staff in response to the work that they have done and they're continuing to do to bring back wording with a resolution in favor. And in no way I, I want people to think that I was making a decision tonight. So there's still work to be done. There's still information to come out, uh, come to us. And I just want to make the clarification that the the uh, resolution to not move forward is an automatic given, and we will be getting both of them when it comes time for a final vote. Thanks for that clarification, Mike. I'm going to, I'm going to pass. Thanks. Okay, Greg. I want to point out that there is some other information in our packet that we requested last time about competing entities across the country in similar programs, and we have that information in front of us. Um, it does, you know, bring up a couple of issues for me. One is that, um, you know, the way business has been going in the last 35, 40 years in this country, especially in relationship to local municipalities, there have been a variety of either um, tax exemption or tax abatement programs that have proliferated around the country because of this, the issue of um, developers, you know, needing to have a little bit of uh, gas to prime the pump, for lack of a better term. And in some cases, and I go back to the the, the ballpark metaphor um, we have seen in other places like Seattle and Sacramento and a few other places where, um, you know, people in these kinds of positions said, well, you know, if you don't give us or invest or the public doesn't vote to bond this, you know, we're going to take our marbles and go somewhere else. And I'm not suggesting that that, that is the case right now, but we are not in a position where somebody is asking us for $400 million or a $1 million or $2 million of cash up front of public money to build something. This is about, you know, a tax exemption, which is no money out of pocket for us. And basically, we're getting, you know, next to nothing in terms of tax revenue on it now. You know, and when was the last time something was there? Wasn't it a gas station? Yeah, it was a Chevron station. How long ago? I don't remember. Not that long. Yeah, I was thinking maybe like seven years. Right? It's, it's been a while. It's it, it's been a while. So before the courthouse was constructed, um, that boy, I'm losing track of that. I think that was oh six. Eight years, seven. nine years ago. Yeah. So the other piece of this too is that you know there's some synergy being created around this site. We have the courthouse, the credit union is getting ready to be built. And then, you know, we could have some residential units come online with this particular project. I think that it, it does have some merit. While I think there's some other problems that, you know, are clearly there, and George has pointed out a number of those issues, um, I think that, um, you know, if we can resolve some of these things between now and next Monday, um, you know, I, I, I see this as a very, very favorable light. I don't think that it's, uh, it's something that's going to, you know, detract from our community at all. It will add value in the end. Well, I would just like to say that I hope that um, uh, whichever direction it goes, it gathers some steam because I think it, this is not the kind of thing that should end up I'm not saying it because I would have to vote. I'm saying because I just don't think that would end up with very good results in the community if this is a four to four kind of decision. So I, I'm saying whatever work you need to do to talk with each other, to think about it, to see if there's which synergy is going in which direction, I, I really encourage you to do that because I, my, if it's a tie, my answer is no. So, there you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Yeah. I, I yes. Just like, I, 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 um, We've already adjourned. Uh, I'm Gavel. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. No. I just. I want to ask a question. Um, when will? When are we planning to vote on the application? Is there a, been a date set? Yeah, it's scheduled to come back for consideration and action on the 17th. The 17th. So this is One without. A week from today. A week from today. So we'll have. Hopefully, have. Well, I don't know. I think we ought to at least wait till we get the manager's recommendation with the, supported by findings and 
And we'll send uh, that out uh, ahead like we would normally do on, on these kinds of things. You all have an AIS this week. Uh, and as George mentioned, uh, there will be a resolution in there that uh, would reject the application, so that will automatically be a part of that as well as a, a second resolution. Well, you know, some people asked some questions, and, and, you know, if we could get answers to those, we have until the last week in July to approve or not approve. That's 180 days from the day that they submitted their application. So we don't have, absolutely have to. I suppose if by next week everyone feels like they've had their questions answered, it would be okay, but... And, um, and, it will, and it will be an option as well as we bring it to you. If the council isn't ready to make a decision, of course, you always have the option of putting it off, putting it off for to a different time. So that's always an option with this or any item as well. So well, yeah, because I think we still need to discuss about you know the legally binding agreement. Is that going to be required? We haven't passed a motion. Um, I think that's super important. Um, you know, there, there are just some, some things we haven't discussed. I'd hate to see it come down to an hour and a half work session and go, oh, okay, time to vote, you know, when when all the issues may not be resolved. And then I just want to make a comment. You know, it's I think we're getting kind of far afield when we're worrying about where students are going to live, whether they're going to be scattered around town, where they're going to move to. And, I mean, it's that gets us away from really looking at this project in itself. And we can't possibly make, a, you know, it, it's not really, I just don't think it's the taxpayer's obligation to decide, to, you know, help decide what part of town students live in, nor to really, frankly, to worry about the Brownfield site. I just, especially when it's going to be for, uh, you know, for, for student housing and just expensive student housing. I, I just don't think that. It's the taxpayer's obligation to subsidize the development there, and I, I just have a feeling that if this gets approved, unless we make really serious modifications to it pre-approval, I, I think it's going to cause a lot of anger and dissatisfaction in the community. People are really, there's just not a heck of a lot of community appetite for things like this anymore, and it's not just in Eugene. It's a trend. It's statewide. It's California. It's... It's starting to happen all around the country. People are really questioning uh, developer subsidies now. And so, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, so, mine isn't related to this at all. Um, I apologize for being late. Work kept me uh, from being here on time, so I didn't get a chance to uh, um, participate in the committee reports and comments. But I had a question for the city manager related to Envision Eugene. Uh, I know we're doing a whole bunch of different activities in Vision Eugene, uh, one of which is this uh, single family housing where we're looking at secondary dwelling units and alley access housing. And um, we had talked about this before, and, and uh, there, I know there's some meetings coming up on this, and we had talked about the fact that one of the other provisions of Vision Eugene was that we were doing a special area study around the university uh, related to Vision Eugene because of the unique pressures on that community, uh, especially with regard to development, and, and this is a good example, um, and, and talked about having that university area that's going to be in that special area study be exempt from this uh, until that study is complete. And so uh, I was wondering if you could talk to that. Oh, Sarah, you might be better able to do that. Hmm? Um, I, I don't know the results of the meeting, but I know that the planning director met with neighborhoods last week and started talking through some of the ideas that I think you had posed and they had posed too, so I don't know the results of that, um, but we'll be following up with you on that. Good ideas. Um, before we wrap it up, I guess my only uh, listening to you all and knowing that you're in the midst of, not, not related to this project in particular, but knowing that you're in the midst of this larger Mufti discussion, it's a little unsettling to be having that discussion kind of coming out of two sides. On one hand, you're talking about how to make it work better. On the other hand, you're questioning whether it should be there at, at all. So it's, um, I mean, that's a, a sort of a fundamental thing. Are we all working really hard to fix something that no, that people don't want to 
have used. That's what I, I mean, I would really appreciate some clarification on that as we get to that, um, that because that has a lot to do with what we think, is the, what tools we have in our toolbox to, to, um, to do things with. And so I'm not going to call on one person. I'm just going to be hopeful that everybody, when we get to that, We'll, we'll discuss it and and have a direction, very transparent direction that we uh, hope to go at.